for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I talked to Travis Montague, who's the founder and CEO of Holler. Holler creates and delivers useful, entertaining, and expressive branded and original visual content that adds texture and emotion to messaging environments. If you've ever used Venmo and applied a sticker, you're using Holler, and he's embedded his technology in many, many other apps and environment. So on the show today, Travis and I talk about that founding story and how he went from working at Chick-fil-A to private equity to tech startup founder. And we also talk about where Holler's going, the opportunities for marketers and how to use expressive and emotion conversational media. And we talk quite a bit about diversity and inclusion, both Travis's own experiences as well as what he's doing to build it into the culture of his company at Holler. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Travis Montague. Travis, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Alan. This is going to be a fun conversation. And it starts off with a twist, I think, that most people may not be expecting to hear. But I have to ask, you have to tell us the story of going from working at Chick-fil-A to private equity. How in the world did that transition transpire? Yeah. So what most people don't know is selling chicken was a, a in big high demand for private equity. I'm just kidding. But um yeah, so I started working at Chick-fil-A really early in my career, uh, early being 15. And what was really interesting about that experience was that while I started as a cashier in cleaning dining rooms, I got my first promotion that same year to trainer for doing the kind of standard day-to-day job really well. What was inaugurally a high school job for me turned into a really awesome experience. I got promoted five times in the span of four years. So by the time I was 19, I was training director and GM, managing about 120 people, working with corporate, got to engage with people in the C-suite and others, and helping them with top four expansion. So it was an incredible experience for me. I got to be invested in heavily while I was in high school, and it really helped shape some of the the core skills that I took with me for the rest of my career. The Chick-fil-A gave me a scholarship to attend the University of Miami given that they wanted me to stay with the business. And at 19 years old, I decided that that wasn't probably what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I was studying finance at the time and a private middle market private equity firm based in South Florida just found what I was doing pretty unique and novel, but they offered me a full-time job. So I worked there during, while attending college full-time and it really gave me the best blend of learning broader leadership skills and how to manage people at a really early age, but also some of the technical chops from a finance slash investor perspective that, you know, ultimately those two together kind of was the the underlying fundamentals or bedrock of what I used to start my business and my entrepreneurial career later on. Yeah. Well, I love the story in part because I think you're the fastest transition from Main Street to Wall Street, I've ever heard of. Um, so, you know, like from one moment, and you, it does sound like some phenomenal experience from the last conversation we had about Chick fil A and just the management experience that you were able to glean from that. Cause it, at an early age, that's, that's probably a highly important lesson to learn. And I, I know you value that experience a lot. And then private equity on the flip side, just completely different environment. And um, a goal, if you will, for for the type of work that you're doing. How did you transition from then? You know, you're at college. You're in this. You're working full time, I guess, for this private equity firm. How did you go from that to then eventually founding Holler? Yeah. So there was a. I took a brief intermission. <laughs> I, so when I was working in private equity, I wanted to. So I had big aspirations of working on Wall Street. And I wanted to work bulge bracket. And it was kind of like a kind of dream of mine at the time. And so usually you would do investment banking, go to private equity after, but I went the reverse way. So I went from private equity back into investment banking for a short stint, worked at Barclays in consumer retail. And it was, you know, I'd learned a lot of things while I was there, um, how to function in a, in a kind of a bulge bracket environment. 
but I ultimately thought that I came from a position where I was able to move up really quickly early on in my life and make what I felt was a broader impact. And in that type of machine, I didn't feel like I was having this type of impact that I'm accustomed to. And that wasn't going to sit well with me. I knew for too long. And so I was supposed to be working at Goldman Sachs full time. When I graduated, I ultimately turned that down because I, at the same time, had a, as, as kind of a side hustle, was uh, explore, following the trends of what was happening in big data and learning more about machine learning in general. And ultimately, I found I felt inspired to start my own company based off of those passions and some some burning issues that I sought out to solve early when I started uh, my own business. Gotcha. So for listeners, if you're keeping track, you've gone from Main Street to Wall Street and now pivoting into the equivalent of Silicon Valley. <laughs> Is that fair to say? Yeah. All by the age of like 20. So <laughs> Right, right, <laughs> right. Like rapid, I mean, rapid progression here in terms of like what works, what what you like, what's not working for you. I can only, it's almost hard to imagine myself. I mean, I, I don't know about your family background, but like I came from a working class family, went to college, right? You know, kind of like half paid for it, half took out loans. Uh, you were on scholarship, kind of get this like what you think might be a dream job on Wall Street. And not only a dream job, but you, you get Goldman Sachs offering you a job and you're like, nah, nah, I'm going to go do something else. Like wh what was that decision like? Just curious. So there was the way I thought about it, and there was the way that my mother thought about it, which was two completely different thoughts. I remember my mom calling my mom and saying, "Hey, mom, who, by the way, she, you know, I'm graduating. She's already told everybody, all her friends, and Travis is off to Goldman Sachs to work." And then I call her and say, "I'm not doing that, and I'm going to go start this other company and start start an app." By the way, and then she said, then I said to her. Well, she asked me, well, how does it make money? And I'm like, well, we don't know that yet. <laughs> right? so, so that was an interesting one to explain. But yeah, no, I, I, I just really saw a lot of promise in what was happening in the world of uh, big data machine learning, kind of looking, looking at how people were using AI to influence consumer experience. And I wanted to take a part of that, although I did not have any background in technology at the time. Uh, personally, I wasn't an engineer. So, you know, for me, I went off to start this company from scratch, uh, trying to find the right people, uh, talent, resources to help me build it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing because you've been hugely successful, but like these, these twists and turns, like you're not, not only like turning down Goldman Sachs, but going into an app business, with, it was a side hustle. So you, you hedged your bets there, but you don't have a technology background. Well, before we go there, Let's tell people what Holler is. Like, what do you guys do today? Just to give some context. Yeah. So um, Holler is a messaging technology company that all about making consumer conversations online better. So we're integrated in some of the largest communication platforms, everything from chat, social, dating, keyboards, even applications like Venmo. We use AI to understand the context of conversations so that we could suggest the right content at the right time, making it super easy for people to use the content that they want in their messages when they're sending them to people. Content today for us is stickers, gifts, things that people love, and we're using over a billion conversations a day. But you know, for us, for content is content. And so we're always thinking about what are the other types of content needs that people have in the future, and we'll provide those for them. But our broader why is to foster empathy and understanding between all people online. And we use AI and content to do that for people. Yeah. So just to put, put a fine exclamation point on this, you are now embedded in these massive <laughs> successful hit <laughs> software companies by providing this added, if you will, expression and communication through the content that you're talking about, like the stickers and things like that. So when I pay my lawn mowing guy down the street, you know, I can put a lawnmower with a thank you message in there, right? Yeah. So very simply, every single sticker that you've added to a payment note in Venmo, that's provided by Holler. <laughs> so uh, you're welcome. For everybody out there who's gotten to experience that. That's awesome. So, I mean, I think the context matters here because like if we go back to coming out of college, 
almost went to Goldman Sachs. Now you pivot to your side hustle business and you don't have a technology background. How do you, where did technology factor in? And like, how did you even begin to create a company? Tell me a little bit about that journey. Like, and you must be the most resourceful guy I've ever met in my life, or you've got like some magic wand that I need to know. <laughs> yeah. So when you start a company, you're like, you're, you're pitching three people, you're pitching customers, you're pitching investors and you're pitching people to help build you build this. And so, you know, for me, I first started with pitching people and I went around, I went to the engineering school first, convinced some other kids to help me prototype what was our initial app. Eventually they, you know, that only worked as a prototype and the kids in the engineering school, they had other things that they wanted to do. So it was me walking around with a prototype. It was interesting though, my roommate's father came to visit and I was explaining to him this like business that I was starting and how excited I was about it and how it was going to be huge. And he happened to be own a outsourced software development business. And at the end of it, he was like, well, I could help you. And so he started to help me and he invested a little bit of money to help me kind of take that prototype a little bit further. But then it was when he introduced me to who became our first full time employee and served as CTO. And even till this day, he's our chief architect. I got him to join me early on. And that's when I really started to see the progression of the product. Hired a data science lead. I used to travel all around, pitch competition after pitch op competition, kind of just boots on the ground. Like I remember, I mean, there's pictures of me standing up with a, t at like put my stand at a stand, pitching my product to people who were walking by at like these kind of startup events hoping to get a, a partner uh, or an investor or anything to help me build this. And, you know, you, you have hundreds of conversations, right? And it only takes one to really matter and move things along. And I was lucky enough to find a couple of those conversations out of all the ones I had that really mattered and moved to me and helped me, helped me feel confident enough to not only me feel confident enough, but like I raised my first friends and family around while I was in college. So before I graduated and gave the people who seed invested, who was our seed investors enough confidence to invest in us and saw us take this to the next level. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're enrolling people, talking to people, getting them excited about it until you had a little bit of seed money. I'm guessing it was just like your charm is <laughs> how you were convincing people to, to join your call, so to speak. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, so at the early days, people invest in, you're asking everyone to make an investment, whether it's their time, whether it's money or anything. And people invest in things that they find to be inspiring, right? And one of the things that when I talk to any founder, they ask the question, well, how you start? And I was like, well, first of all, you have to have enough conviction within yourself to start, right? And put yourself out there and passionately pursue your endeavor in a way that's inspiring to others. And when you do that, when you, when you pursue with such passion, it inspires other people to around you to invest with whatever they can. Sometimes it's capital, sometimes it's their time. And that's how you start. You don't have to have all of the skills in order to build your business, right? You don't even have to have the money to build your business. But what you have to have as a founder is the kind of energy to inspire other people around you to do what you believe should be done in the world. You now have Holler. You're embedded in all these successful apps. You're, I'm sure you're, you're building new relationships as we speak. You've got this AI machine learning and content engine that's like dynamically suggesting content based on how people are interacting, if you will, in the app itself. What is it about the, I think what you call expression, right? Like the stickers, the ability to visually or, or put a stamp, if you will, of expression on what you're doing. What is it about that in particular that excited you? Like, why did why was that the thing that you focused on? Well, it's interesting because it wasn't the thing initially. And it was kind of one of the, and I, at the risk of sounding cliche, it's like I stumbled upon this without trying to initially. So when I, when I started the business, the company was called Spliced. And essentially it was an application that delivered people things based off of their interest. So think like, a suggestions engine that delivered you news and video content based off identified interests or things that we learned about your behavior online. And the first tagline was your interest delivered, right? And during that experience, in the application that we built, we, I launched it and I wanted people to share content with each other more. 
And one of the realizations I had or epiphanies was that, well, maybe the reason why people don't share content that they see is because they don't have anything to say per se. But everything you see makes you feel a certain way. So what if you could just share that feeling? And so I removed, I proceeded to remove all words from the all words from the application and allow people to only share content by using one of 12 emojis, right? Smiley faces. And this was before Facebook reactions and all those things existed. And that's all that people were doing. And what it made me realize was that in a world where there are many places where people could get news and video content, this notion of digital expression or visual communication was important, right? And it was going to be even more important as our conversations were migrating from in-person communication to online at a pace that we've never seen before. You know, if you look at it today, it's even, it's, it's profound, right? We have, there's a hundred trillion messages uh, sent online across all the different environments versus 1.8 trillion searches on Google, for example. And we've also seen the rise of categorical messaging. So not only messaging that in one particular channel like chat, but you see it in social work productivity. I mean, we feel that even more today, right? Gaming, dating, the spaces that we message have become numerous. But it was really early on that I realized that the way that we experienced the internet was changing and it was going moving into the, these more digital like conversational interfaces. So the need for tools that help us express things that are hard to convey or impossible to convey in text-based environments alone were pertinent. You know, if you look at, there's some studies that were done from some professors at UCLA that showed that when we communicate and someone forms their opinion, only 7% is based off the words, 38% is based off the tone of voice, and 55% is based off body language. So 93% of communication or understanding is nonverbal. And so people being able to ascribe their feelings to these images like gifts or memes or stickers were important. And I think we all feel that today, right? Like that moment when you somebody sends you a GIF or a sticker or anything, you really get how that person feels or what they're trying to convey. So it was that, that insight. Like I started doing a lot of thought leadership about visual communication. I released the first emoji report ever. It still gets like when I was saying emojis were a thing and everybody's like, what is he talking about? I started calling emojis content and people were like, is this, he's talking about a smiley face, right? But this was years ago, right? I started calling it content in 2014. And now it's kind of like gifts and all these things are, it's, it's not far. It's more commonplace to think about these things as content today, but it certainly wasn't when I started back then. But yeah, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's all about this higher level concept of conversational media, the types of content that we use in peer to peer environments that have become so prevalent today. And we were early kind of advocate for that type of media in the world, which we're really proud of. Yeah, no, I mean, kudos on the success because it, it's hard to, it's hard to think about, it's hard to think about not using those things now, <laughs> as, as maybe hard as it was to think about using them in the beginning as you were talking to people, but like, it's hard not to imagine having them available. So you, you know, one piece of your business is working to embed what the work and I guess the code base, if you will, into other apps with partners, but you're also starting to work with brands and marketers as well. Like, how does that work? Tell me what the extension there is. Yeah. So this is like, it's super exciting, right? So you heard me mention conversational media. So we've seen this explosion of different types of formats. So conversational media is all of the types of content that people use to help express themselves or, or convey or help facilitate a conversation in peer-to-peer -peer communication environments. So you think about stickers, GIFs, memes, lenses, filters, like all of these tools that people are using fall in the category of conversational media. And what's really exciting about these things is that people are using these tools in very intimate places with people that are most important to them. Like when they feel beautiful or they're excited or they're hungry or they're not feeling well, all of these different emotions that brands have wanted to associate themselves with viscerally, right, for people, but they had no avenue to really do that historically. Marketers didn't have the tools to be like right there in the moment, in the context that they wanted to be so that they can make a connection or resonate with consumer. And so that's what conversational media has provided. And that's the type of work we've been doing with brands. We've partnered with brands like 
I read Orbit and Musnex and Chipotle and Molson Coors, like all of these different brands that want to reach consumers in the moment and be part of the conversation. So for example, Molson Coors, uh, not Molson Coors, Ikea wanted to reach consumers when around the concept of sleep, right? When they were promoting their new set of mattresses and bedding line products. And so, you know, with our technology, because we understand context, we're able to understand every single moment that happens, whether it's good night, good morning, I'm tired, et cetera. And we were able to provide users with content and tools to express that to somebody else. And it was all branded and sponsored by IKEA. We're able to do that with Starbucks, for example, around summer drinks, right? So you're paying your friend for the, the beach day or coffee or anything, or you're having that conversation in a messaging app somewhere, you know, we are able to surface their content without users having to find it uh, right there in that moment so that consumers were using it. So it wasn't just about coffee. It was about Starbucks, right? We we're able to alter that moment. I've been really excited to see the level of creativity that have been, has been going around. Like, I mean, it's flat out funny <laughs> and creative <laughs> what's been going on. The share rates have been absurd. Like we've been seeing some campaigns get share rates as high as 21% of consumers who get who see their content, they're sharing it. I mean, like I haven't seen this level of engagement, these types of engagement rates anywhere in online. So, you know, when you have a plat, when you, ha- you look at messaging as a channel, that's enabling you people to marketers, brands to kind of reach consumers based off of their intent at mass scale. So if that coffee moment or tired or hunger moment or whatever, and then also get the benefit, like you have the, the kind of intent-driven nature of search, but then you have the earned kind of media of social, right? Because people are sharing that content with their peers uh, to one or many people. So yeah, I mean, it's been a it's been an awesome category that we've seen grow and is growing and we're, we're working with brands to be there. Yeah, no, I, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm just imagining myself, like I'm, I, I want a donut and uh, a Boston cream Dunkin' Donuts pops up in my, my feed for me to share as I want a snack, a pick me up in the afternoon or, or in the morning for that matter. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I can see how, it, I mean, it's just natural. You're already express, you're already trying to communicate with whoever it is that you're communicating with. And these things just make it easier to express it, even amplify amplify the message so it makes perfect sense like marketers would want to be there at the moment that people are talking about their category or you know potentially entering into their category i'm hungry i'm sleepy i'm tired i'm thirsty you know like it's a it's a perfect branding opportunity frankly yeah no it's been, it's been really and the types of strategies that i've seen have been really remarkable um so i'm excited to continue to see what people do yeah, I mean, if you're not working with them already, one of the pre- people that's been on the show before is uh, Jill Baskin at the Hershey Company. And um, you should check out what they're doing because I, I think they're trying to do a lot of similar things. Might be a, a willing participant there in the future for you. But I do want to pivot a little bit because as phenomenal as your like startup experience has been, the success of the business, what you're doing from a conversational media standpoint, and and now working with brands and big marketers, you're also taking on diversity and inclusion. I mean, just by your your existence, frankly, you know, you're an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur and CEO who happens to be black, right? And I say it that way on purpose, and I hope you don't, you're not offended by it, but like you're successful in the right of being a CEO and an entrepreneur. And yes, you are black. I can only imagine like I am not, well, any of those to the extent that you are today. I can only imagine like what the, what life has been like, right? To get to where you are. And I can only imagine because I haven't been in your shoes. So how do you think about it as it relates to just your personal journey? And then I'd love to talk about how you're doing, dealing with it, with your company that you're building too. Yeah. So I'll start with the former and I'll speak to the latter as well. And so we you know what's really interesting is when you think about like tech and startup and entrepreneurship in general, the way that things have been designed supports certain types of paths, right? So let's let's, let's let me break that down for you. So in a startup, you're supposed to build a prototype, raise a friends and family round, which a couple hundreds of thousands of dollars from your friends and family, and then 
away you go and start building your business, right? Well, the reality is, is that many, most actually people don't have access to people who could just write two, $300,000 investments in your idea, right? Like that type of environment is not really attainable for many people. And so the idea that it, that's why so, it, sometimes it, seems, it feels so far-fetched as not a concept for certain aspects, certain people in underrepresented communities to approach and start a tech business. One, and then not even to go into the fact that you need talent and all sorts of things to make it happen. But there was, there's even a broader problem from there. So say if you're able to conjure up the resources to do what you need to do, the way that, and you've seen this type of kind of pipeline issue in many other places, right? But there's a pipeline issue where this same A, Series A investors invest from the same Series C investors, the B investors invest in A investors that they know. Like it kind of like goes up the chain, right? You're seeing investment, ha- like the types of companies that succeed are being funneled through the same pipeline of places, right? And that doesn't mean that in- innovation could come from outside of the Valley. It could come from all sorts of places all around the world. And most definitely a lot of places in the United States, because there's people who I could see and experience problems and find opportunities that may not exist just in Silicon Valley or some of the, the hubs from the same kind of disciplines. So there's just a gen- that general pipeline issue. You see that same issue, by the way, in other industries that you know have been addressed more concretely. So you look at finance, for example, where you know you look at the fact that a lot of the Ivy League school schools recruit from the same private high schools, the same banks recruit from the same Ivy League schools. So, you know, that pipeline exists from there. There's a whole thing about target and non-target, right? Like that, even that concept on its own, right? Like you think about that, right? Like some of these things that we think are commonplace, it's like, nope, non-target. So we don't look there. Not that good people can't be there. So it's, it, it's, it's a problem that exists in many different dimensions. It just hasn't been, there hasn't been the same type of resources and investment and in correcting it in the tech industry, especially from an entrepreneurship perspective and an investment perspective, which is why still to this day, we have less than 1% of investment going to black founders today. So that's one of the things that is real for me. I was never shy of any of those types of things. Like I was not supposed to be managing 120 people at 19. I was not supposed to be at Goldman coming from University of Miami. And certainly odds are I don't traditionally look like a tech founder who's in social and AI, right? Like that's, I'm a party of pretty much one here in that regard. So I'm very much understand and appreciate the challenges that are, are there. But I am very hopeful because I've seen a lot of really awesome movement happen over the last several months, especially to make that change. And so I'm very, I'm very hopeful. And, and, you know, I think that's, I think we could, with continued energy and investment, I think we will see this industry catch up because it's certainly behind. But the latter piece though, so that was my, my, my kind of experience. I obviously, you know, we've, I've raised money and, and built and, you know, I've surrounded myself with an incredible team of people really following kind of an, a kind of social framework that I believe is important, not just for society, but I think if having that the right compass is a competitive advantage in the business. And I'll explain more why in a second. But the other thing I've been talking about recently is the issue around corporate diversity, diversity, inclusion, and lastly, belonging. And so I wrote a piece in Fortune where I talked about diversity shouldn't be our end goal, changing the current corporate culture should. Right. And so fun at the highest level, the in corporate America, what we've what we've done is we've treated diversity as a bolt on to a corporate culture that has historically been white male. And so we we've, we've set our ratios. We bolt we bolted on the programs. Uh, we've created employee research groups. We've done these things. And in many cases, it's been a check the box. But then you look at progression over time and fall offs and looking at diversity at the highest ranks it teeters off still. And so if there's, if you go into, I actually just shared a, a, had a presentation recently internally where we showed in the tech space that there is a dramatic fall off. Like when you look at the, at the entry level of people coming into the tech space in tech companies, there's a great distribution of women, people of color, more diversity on the entry levels. 
the teetering off as you move through those ranks is very stark out of women, people of color, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a very interesting uh, kind of eye-opening thing that I saw. I shared it with our leadership team and you know our broader company. But at Holler, we're thinking about how do we create a culture that not only is diverse, but it's really inclusive and ultimately people belong, right? And it's a culture that celebrates people from all different types of backgrounds and it's embedded in our DNA. Like we as human beings, we actually like diversity quite a bit, right? Think about how mundane the world would be if we only ate one type of food, right? We love food from all over the world, from different types of places and people. We also like to travel and when we travel, we like to see the locals, right? And we like to experience their culture and their traditions and things like that. We just haven't done that in corporate America, which is my, my key point. And so how do you create a place that people not only ex- bring in the diversity, accept diversity, but celebrate diversity, embrace diversity, and treat it as a competitive advantage as a business? And it's important because we don't serve specific people, right? At Holler, we service millions of people around the world. And the more diverse our perspectives are in, in, internally in how we manage our business, it helps shape our thesis and our plans in ways that address a broader collective. And, you know, I think that it's just how we need to, to kind of approach the business. So we've rolled out so many different programs to do that. We've been driving conversations internally that drive awareness about different things, not just Black people. It's just about all sorts of different types of groups. Um, we brought in speakers. We created environments for people to who want to lean in and learn, learn. And then also we've even done things like, like look at our calendars of the things that we celebrate as a company, right? Of course, we added Juneteenth, but we also had a vote to figure out what are the types of types of cultures and things that we sh- you think we should be add- adding to our calendar, celebrating not just the kind of traditional ones as well. So we're, do- we're taking it in our own way at Holler, but we do be- we- we've seen that it's been appreciated by many people. And you know, I'm personally excited that it's happening. Well, I want to applaud your efforts. I mean, I, I think it's one thing to experience it and, and go through it yourself. And, but then, you know, to take that learning and try to apply it and build a better culture um, in the organization that you're building and trying to scale as well. And I, I love all the suggestions that you, you just listed off. So um, I hopefully listeners that are out there that have are empowered and have the ability to drive change within their own organizations, get some good ideas to take away and, and think about how they could implement the types of things that you're doing. Well, Travis, I think one of the, you've listed, you know, like I just mentioned a lot of ideas. Is there any advice you'd give to other leaders out there, whether they're entrepreneurs or whether they're in big companies? It seems like this notion of belonging is the goal and to create a culture, not a bolt on to use your words. Any advice as to like getting started on that or is it just get started? So one of the things I, there's two things I like to say. Like people are like, how do you start? I'm like, start, right? And then indecision is a decision. So for one of the things that I've found is that, you know, and I've talked to different leaders who want to do the right thing. And what I've found most is that they genuinely don't know what to do in, in many times, like how to address it, the times. And the times are strange, right? There's so many things going on. There's everything from racial unrest, fires, and a, an election, right? So- and a pandemic. I the fact that the pandemic was a fourth thing I just mentioned. <laughs> that 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 is 2020 right there. Right. Like, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at this moment in time, more than ever, the responsibility of leaders is greater because you're not only responsible for delivering results to shareholders and investors, et cetera, and customers, but you have a responsibility to take care of people. And that responsibility is it, the only way you could take care of people is to understand what they might be going through. And it's, it's, it might be, out, it, there's literal fires outside. There might be protests outside. They might be stressed about the election that's going on right now. They might have had someone who's unfortunately sick or even worse, might have lost a loved one due to the pandemic. And so the level of empathy that's required as a leader in today's day is more so than it's ever been in recent lifetime, right? And so I think every leader needs to start with that. You need to start with empathy. And you don't need to proclaim that you know all the answers, but what you need to do is 
commit to starting to understand the things that your people are going through. And that might be how their work life needs to change, right? They might have their kids at home and now they're teachers, right? <laughs> they, they've taken up the, the, the responsibility of being a teacher now. And that just creates a different dynamic, right? You might have people who are stressed out. They're, they're Black and they are seeing everything that's happening and they're really stressed out. And so you, it's, it's having a, a separate roadmap. Like I, we, we literally, so one of the things I have, I have a, a stand up standing meeting every single week with my people team about a diversity, inclusion, belonging specifically as one of the topics. And then there's other things that as a CEO that I've added about taking care of our people to like regular parts of my agenda because their well-being is that important. And I need to make sure that the programs that we're putting in place to continue and how we're thinking about it is a, is a leg, you know, that, that even at the CEO level, at leadership level, that I, I'm not just shepherding that out to our people team to say, hey, figure it all out, right? We're, it, it needs to be viewed with that level of priority. But people like, people don't get upset when you don't have all the answers. People get upset when you don't know your position. And so stating your beliefs, stating your position and stating your process is imperative. Like that's what I did. Like even when we start, when, when the topic about racial unrest um, kind of blew up in the way it did over the last couple months, you know, I looked inwards and I was like, I'm a black tech founder and I didn't even have a strong, you know, program and things like that in place. Me, right. It's not that I didn't believe it was important. It was just the fact that, you know, there's so many things that I was doing and I, and I, you know, I looked in and I'm like, you know, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough here. And so like, I was like, not only one, we, we need to use our platforms and say what we believe as a company, but also we need to make sure that internally that we are, are, are doing the right thing. And so we've been doing that and it goes back to just doing the right thing, right? People just want to work for good people. It's kind of simple, but <laughs> you know, you would, you'd be shocked, right? Like how hard of a concept that could be at times, but yeah, that's the advice I'd, I'd give. I love it. It's great advice. Well, um, hard pivot, but <laughs> let's switch gears. And I tend to ask the same set of questions to everyone that comes on the show. And um, so we'll start that series now. I think my favorite question, and it may be, the answer may already lie in something that you've already described. I'm not sure. But the question I like asking the most is, has there been an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? Yeah. So it's not a specific experience. It's, it's, it's an example. You know, so my mother, so I'm first generation American. You know, my mother moved here, grew up very humble beginnings, moved here, started her own businesses. Like I watched my mother work very hard, start a series of beauty salons and beauty supply stores and things like that. And I just work, saw her work hard. Hard, like build every single thing that she had, right? And she afforded me the ability to grow up in a good neighborhood and get the type of education and things like that that I wanted. And like, if I looked at her, where she came from and where she got to, then I was like, well, the only way I could match is if I become like the president. Well, if I become like a, a, a DM or something else in this day and age. And so it was for me, it was watching her work so hard and build her businesses what inspired me to do what I was doing like you know I could be that boss at a teenager as a teenager right and I could start my own company at 20 right like I could do those things none of those things fell off limits to me because I've had the example of my mother who was just a very strong woman an entrepreneur on her own right I love that and you may have made the biggest Freudian slip I've ever had on this show, which is you're going to be running for president one day. <laughs> well, we'll leave that to a, a later discussion. <laughs> okay. Got a couple of things to do. <laughs> next episode. Next yeah. episode, we'll talk yeah. about your aspirations for president. And not to make light of it, but you aren't even old enough yet to run for president, I don't think. <laughs> I think there is an age limit and you're still under 30, I believe, if I've got my stats right. Yeah, but that's never stopped me before. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, what advice would you give your younger self? Um, and I guess we do have to go back pretty young now. So, so my younger self, 
you know, I think my younger self, I was like super, super like intense about, oh, this needs to happen and we have to figure this out right now. And if we don't, it's going to be the end of the world. Right. And like what I've learned over time, if you do the same exercises every day, you get strong and you, you, be, you become a good athlete. And so it was going to be OK. I would give myself the advice of just remember your fundamentals. And this might be, I know that, you know, I grew up playing sports as a kid, but like, remember your fundamentals, right? So for me, I'm like the leadership training I got at, you know, 15, 16 and the technicals that I got in finance and the lessons that I learned as an entrepreneur in the early days, like just remember those fundamentals and focus on them and learn from them and grow them. And ultimately, they will serve as tools for you as you continue to grow. Like, I think that would probably be the most salient advice I would give myself, you know, looking back from where I am now. Awesome. Well, a couple more questions. Um, this next one's a little bit silly, but I'm curious if there's been an impactful purchase of $100 or less in the last, say, year. An impactful purchase of $100 or, or less. It has to be this bone that I bought my dog that's kept him at bay while I try to work from home. <laughs> like, I don't, like me having to work home and having my pup around all the time, he gets jealous of my, my computer because I'm always on Zoom calls and he's wondering what's going on. And so I think that purchase, keeping him, him uh, entertained has given me the, the latitude to keep working <laughs> in, in this, this type of environment over the last year. I love that. What kind, what kind of bone is it, do you know? Like what kind of? I don't know what kind of, I mean, it's a giant one. Like it's like, I mean, it's just like, it must be like a femur of some sort. <laughs> oh. What kind of dog do you have? You have a big dog? I have an all white Siberian Husky. So he's like, you know, his name's Blue, a uh, really good boy, but he is, has Husky energy, as you could imagine, so. So being tra trapped at home during quarantine with me sitting next to him on Zoom is not like how he normally liked to spend the day. Awesome. Well, two last questions for you. Are there brands or companies or causes that you follow or you think other people should take notice of? Yeah. So from causes that I'm, I'm really excited about right now is and corporate diversity uh, and diversity inclusion belonging has been one of the first things I've been talking about. But I've been talking about this broader idea of the next generation tech company and what that means. And so there's how we treat our people and the environment that we create from a corporate culture. But as a tech company, one of the things that I'm thinking about is tech practices and privacy. And like, you know, all of the different, like trying to create the standards and the etiquette around how tech companies behave. Right. And, I, you know, I've, I've started that campaign internally and I'm, I'm going to be going out and having more broader conversations about that externally, more around this concept of service, not surveillance. We need to think about how we as tech, company go, tech companies go back to servicing people and making sure that we are not doing anything that's causing them harm. So with that, you know, some of the, the, the organizations that I've been looking at is Center of Humane Tech. Um, I think the work that they're doing is very fascinating. I also think Global Data Ethics Project is really interesting as well. So you know, those are just kind of two uh, that I've been following. And then I've, it's been really awesome to see certain companies really evolve themselves in the pandemic. You know, whether it's Disney, who just today announced their whole restructuring around streaming, or there's other companies that really, you could see the brand that they built equity over the last, over decades, stand the test of time, whether it's Nike and Ben and Jerry around racial injustice and other things like that, that I, I, you know, I'd be remiss if I don't give certain folks a shout out. So, you know, those are the really good things I've, I've seen. I'm inspired by their work. You know, it helps inform me or gives me ideas about how I run my company as a, as a founder, a CEO, a tech leader, and a person, and just even looking at the examples out there. Awesome. Last question for you is, is there, what do you feel is the largest opportunity or threat that marketers are facing today? The largest threat is the end of identity. So, you know, I, I talk about service, not surveillance, but this notion, we built digital on this core concept of being able to understand a person's identity, being able to under, like track that person's behavior to a very, very 
deep degree. And we've used, we predicated all of our, infra- our platforms, our technologies, our infrastructures around this idea that you know, we're going to be able to amass an incredible amount of data about individuals at that level. I think there's going to be a really stark correction coming up here. I mean, you see some of those, you see some of the ring, the vibrations of that coming here already, whether it's iOS, what, what was iOS 14, although it's a little bit delayed, but the end of the advertiser ID. And we're going to continue to see regulation around what people could do with data, how things work on the internet over the next 12 months even. And so I think that the thing that's going to be m- under most attack over the next, the biggest threat over, I'll say for marketers is the end of the identity. And so it's going to be important for marketers to ask the question, if that capabilities, that capability doesn't exist, so what, right? What, what happens and what are we going to do about it? I don't think that it's a idea. I think it's an eventuality that the abilities would be are going to be dramatically limited. And so I think people should really start thinking about that. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. And I think it gets back to the notion that you mentioned just a minute ago, which is this notion of it's about service, not surveillance. And, you know, if you can provide value, you're providing value, right? <laughs> like, you don't need the surveillance, you don't need to monetize me if I'm willing to give you my money. Exactly. Right. And I think we've, we've, you know, gone a little bit astray on how we think about, you know, our interactions with consumers. Yeah, agreed. Well, Travis, it's been fantastic to have you on the, the show. I, I've learned a lot and I'm sure I will continue to learn more from you as we, uh, as we follow each other. Oh, thank you, Alan. I appreciate you having me on today. I look forward to continuing to listen to all the other episodes. And uh, I hope people enjoy our conversation. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. And you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.